Good morning to you on this Tuesday, March 19th. Good to have you in company for another morning wake Barbados up, wake up, presentation. Wake up, wake up. I'm Tisha Hines, I'll be here with you until Good 8 o'clock this morning. And we're coming to you live from the Standard Showroom here in Wildy and beautiful Barbados. We want to say a special welcome to those of you watching online as well. Always good to have you in company, connecting via YouTube or whichever social media platform you prefer you absolutely can find us there so we have a good show planned for you today the morning after the night before ah budget presentation last night i know that's top of mind for everybody so we certainly will delve in in a way that you can understand try to dissect some of the things that were presented and see if we can uh, get to where the rubber meets the road so where it affects you and me in a tangible kind of way I mean, ultimately, macro decisions affect us. But, uh, you know, we want some directness. So Professor Don Marshall is going to be in to share with us. That's a little later this morning. We're also going to get a chance to meet some members of the Karifta swim team. They're going to be here. I see lots of them already uh, with us and getting ready to share exactly how they're prepping to rep for Barbados over the Easter weekend. Plus, we are sharing all about UE and how they are celebrating. They have a big celebration coming up with Open Week. Uh, we're looking at uh, a student in early childhood education. Uh, that program is available. And we're going to talk about other programs that are available in the Faculty of Humanities at UE Hill. Of course, we set the tone for that yesterday when we had the Deputy Dean come in to share a little bit more about how humanities or the study of humanities can really be, be incorporated into all different areas and careers and things like that. But we want to start with our conversations on CARICOM and it's wonderful to have uh, David Kamishong, Barbados Ambassador to CARICOM back with us. This morning he brings us uh, Minabi Ford who is Executive Director at the Mignon Innes Ford Foundation. And some years ago, uh, the ambassador shared this book with me, The Pan-African Love Story of Arnold and Mignon Ford. Now, this lady is the granddaughter of these two people who first immigrated from Barbados to the US and then moved to Ethiopia. And she grew up with these Barbadian grandparents. So, she joins us this morning to talk a little bit about it. Uh, first came to Barbados back in 2007, so uh, definitely has been around. But good morning. Good to have both of you with us. Good morning. morning Thank you for having us. Absolutely, and welcome. I'm going to start with you, Ambassador. Welcome back home. I know you've been knowing quite a bit of travel. Mm -hmm. Yes. Fortunately, so, I'm here now. <laughs> yes, you are. So talk to us a little bit about, first of all, the writing of this book. Yes, well, this book um, was a product of the first COVID lockdown. This is how I spent the COVID lockdown, writing this book, because I had met Minyabi's father, um, Arnold and Mignon's son, several, many years ago. And I had promised him at the time that I would write the story of his parents' lives. These two great Barbadian heroes who repatriated to the African continent, um, to Ethiopia. And I only got the opportunity during that um, COVID lockdown. But this story is so important for CARICOM, but even more specifically for Barbados, because Barbadians need to know, right, that, um, you know, right now we are pursuing a relationship with Africa. So we, we have established an embassy in Ghana, one in Kenya, a consulate in Rwanda. We have the Afri Exim Bank here in, in Barbados. Um, CARICOM and the African Union uh, meeting and so forth. But we need to know that Barbados has a very serious back to Africa heritage. Um, going all back to um, the time of the Bussa Rebellion. When after they executed so many of the, of the rebels, they deported... I'm close to 100, and sent them ultimately to Sierra, Le Sierra Leone. So the Barbadians became, went back to, to Sierra Leone, became a very important 
part of the population of Sierra Leone. And then, in, then we had the Rio Pongas mission in the 1850s where through Codrington College, many black Barbadians went back to Guinea. And then in 1865, we had the Liberia migration, where hundreds of Barbadians um, went to Liberia. But many of us don't know about the Ethiopia repatriation. And this is where Arnold and Mignon come in, because these two Bajans actually led that movement of repatriation to Ethiopia. So that is the CARICOM and Barbados historical context to the story of Minyabi's grandparents. All right, so you back onto the uh, huge painting that we have here on the set mm -hmm. as you were talking about them leading. Tell us a bit more about this because I see Beth Benai, uh, Rabbi Arnold Ford. So let's talk a little bit about this pa painting. Well, this painting was done by um, Barbadian artist David Guru McLean, and it shows Arnold in his Harlem days as the great, he was a master musician and he was also um, a Jewish rabbi. But I'll let Minyabi explain more about, about the painting. Um, and those aspects of Arnold. All right, so again, welcome. And uh, I think that was quite the welcome. <laughs> yes, thank you so much. I'm very honored to be here and I thank the ambassador for really helping me get here. I'm very excited to come and tell the story about inter interesting in, uh, pioneering Barbadians that were uh, instrumental in helping modernize education in Ethiopia. Uh, initially, of course, they were uh, here and they migrated to Harlem. My, both my grandparents uh, were born here. Uh, once they arrived in the United States, they were very active in different aspects. With the UNI, my grandfather participated along with Marcus Garvey. He was the musical director uh, for the UNI, as well as he also founded the Bene Beit Abraham Synagogue. And uh, he had a group of uh, mostly Caribbean uh, members as well as he was also a composer and a poet. His main mission was really to continue the connection of the Pan-African identity. During the various UNIA convention, the, His Majesty from Ethiopia sent a delegation to ask for assistance and help modernizing Ethiopia. At that time, as many people may know, there was a lot of Back to Africa movement and the UNI, over having over 8 million members, was very active in all aspects of organizing. And uh, many people were getting ready to go to Liberia. But my grandfather being a rabbi and meeting with an Ethiopian Jew to invite him to come help, they decided to go to Ethiopia. And that was the initiation of them coming to Ethiopia to be part of the modernization. So my grandfather, uh, my grandparents met in Harlem. My grandmother was his musical student. She taught her music. Um, he came first to Ethiopia in 1930 with a delegation. And later on, my grandmother joined him. They married there, and they had my father and my uncle. And uh, soon after, the Italians were coming and invading, and my grandfather was in ill health. And before he passed away, he asked my grandmother not to leave Ethiopia. And she gave him her word she would live as Ethiopian and die as an Ethiopian. And she remained, and he soon passed. As a true Bajan woman with two little boys, she had to find uh, employment and also to visualize. She was also invited with, uh, from another delegation to come help with education. It was more of voluntary help and she felt very good about it. it was like coming back home to her. So she had to come up with many ingenious ways to survive because the Italians were coming in, massacring the local population in Addis Ababa. And she participated in the freedom struggle by having people meet in her place and writing papers. She was arrested and you know really beaten up, but she came through. Uh, later on, she, was, uh, she wanted to teach uh, there was an attempt for her to teach at a new school, but soon she realized she would be working under a European boss, and she didn't want that. After that, she opened the first co-educational school, and she named it Beta, Beta Uriel, House of Light, along with two of her partners from the Caribbean. 
she started the long journey of modernizing Ethiopian education. At that time, girls were not educated, with boys, mostly not even educated. This is in 1940. So she, first, she opened the first co-educational school in 1941, and she introduced all aspects of modern education, uh, Boy Scout, Girl Scout, gymnastics, all that she did. Uh, so this is part of the story I wanted to tell on her part. My grandfather also was instrumental in designing the red, green and black flag about the black liberation of freedom, uh, feeling the need to have an identity of our own. Uh, not against, but for us, because we are important. Uh, a lot of people see that as against, no. It's more like we matter to ourselves, we come first. All right, so that's, that's a, a wonderful story. And of course, it's all shared uh, with, within the pages of of this book that you've written. Yes. Uh, so very interesting stuff. You brought us some photographs as this well. This is my grandfather. <laughs> this is your grandfather. Arnold Josiah Ford. Arnold Josiah, Josiah Ford. Or as Rabbi Ford. Rabbi Ford. Yes. And, he is. and when you see him here, he's with his big standing base. And what is so remarkable is that this man who was born in Barbados in that dark colonial period, 1877, he actually was, his parents were able to get him lessons in violin, harp, and the standing bass. Wow. <laughs> you know, so he became a master musician. He actually um, played a very important part in the Harlem Renaissance in developing black music in, in New York. And um, he, so he's at, he's at the very foundation of the development of jazz, of the development of black concert music. And, um, but his most famous musical accomplishment is as the musical director of Marcus Garvey's Universal Negro Improvement Association, that stirring anthem, the Universal Ethiopian Anthem. Um, you remember some, a couple of years ago, I got the Marlon Legal Voice Project to do a recording of it. Ethiopia, the land of our fathers. Now, um, back in those dark days when we were all colonies, that was decreed to be the national anthem of all black people. That anthem was sung all over the world. It is perhaps the single most important song in the history of black music. Wow, and this is a photograph of your Me grandmother. Not. Yes. A uh, very interesting um, story from your grandparents. I'm intrigued to find out um, how your grandmother introduced you to Barbados. Obviously, she would have introduced your dad and your uncle, first of all. But what are some of the things she was uh, saying about her homeland? Well, my grandmother, you know, uh, already was in Ethiopia. And my father, after I was born, I was with my maternal grandmother. And then I went with my paternal grandmother, Mignon, who became my mother. And um, she ran the boarding school and the day school. Uh, but in the house, it was like a West Indian. My diet, my lifestyle, my thinking, especially as a woman, that you can do anything was entrenched in my brain without really realizing it. Um, she communicated her culture through her deeds, through her work, such that it was already inside us. The curriculum also was Pan-African. She was able to bring all the different ethnicity, all the different nationality in her school under a Pan-African uh, ideal where all of us are one. We work together to uplift our nation. So that's how I learned about being Barbadian. And that's, to me, that's what it meant. It was different than the traditional Ethiopian upbringing, which is more conservative. Whereas growing under my grandmother, I just felt that a woman can do anything. It, she did everything. She taught gymnastics, she taught piano, she did theater, she wrote a play uh, about Toussaint Olivier when I was a little kid. So I knew about the great things the Caribbean people were accomplishing in Africa. And it was a very news, good news and news to most Ethiopians because they really have no idea such a faraway place, let alone black people lived. She, so, could I say that she um, was like an ambassador, an unofficial ambassador for the Caribbean in Africa. So for example, when 
Emperor, and she had a very special relationship, relationship with Emperor Haile Selassie. In fact, he was, he, you know, he helped to sponsor her school. He actually prevailed upon her to change the name of her school um, and to name it in honor of his young daughter, Princess Zeneba Walk, who died very tragically. So the school became famous um, uh, for its connection with His Imperial Majesty and the, the royal family. And, um, but she consciously saw herself as an ambassador of Barbados and the Caribbean um, in Ethiopia. And so, for example, when, when Emperor Selassie visited the Caribbean in 1966, and more specifically Barbados, you know, um, she, would, she would have been very proud of um, the fact that her emperor was now visiting Barbados on the verge of Barbados becoming um, independent. So she played that role as an unofficial ambassador of Barbados and the Caribbean in Ethiopia for many, many, um, many decades. Wow. Uh, on the heels of everything that's happening with the connections that we're now making once again with Africa and so many African nations, um, really setting up uh, embassies and things of that nature. It's wonderful to be able to share these stories Formation. all over again <laughs> because some of these stories are stories that we didn't even know existed of Barbadians who immigrated as far back as the 20s and 30s Correct. and helped to really develop the continent in so many ways. And even now we're seeing Liberians coming back to Barbados mm. after having those initial 300 plus Liberians who went to Barbadians, Barbadians who, went. who went to Liberia yeah. all those years ago. So this and is became wonderful. presidents of Liberia. Presidents of Liberia. You know, very high officials. Wonderful so, stuff. So I, it's so important that our young people know this mm. because especially now that we have become a republic, you know, we have thrown off the last vestiges of um, uh, European colonial rule. We have taken our full sovereignty into our own hands. Um, we have con consolidated our national identity. We are stepping out onto the, onto the world stage, particularly with an orientation towards Africa, the African continent. Um, it's important that these stories of Bajans <laughs> who, who, who laid this groundwork, who created this foundation for us um, so, so long ago that we know these, we know these stories, that we embrace these heroes and we use them as a source of, of inspiration. All right. Well, I must say thank goodness for COVID because you said COVID <laughs> yeah. is when you took the time to write this. Yeah. Uh, always positives in everything we do. Yeah. So I really want to thank you for coming in. Um, this painting is stunning. I don't know if we're doing it justice in the way we're showing it on television, but where, where can people see this? Where can people go to take in this? work of well, art right now is is at my home however um we in the works is um a, a new auditorium in queen's park that will be named after marcus garvey you know, marcus garvey visited us in 1937 and spoke in queen's park and i have pledged um, to our minister with responsibility for culture that once that auditorium is established, this will be donated um, to that auditorium. So this will be in a public space where the Barbadian people can come and view it as one of their one of their great yeah, one of our come, our great heroes. Come and take it in. Thank you so mm -hmm. much, Ambassador Comichon, Barbados Ambassador to CARICOM, etc. <laughs> Have the body, etc. on it, <laughs> and of course Minabi Ford. Uh, executive director of the Migden Innes Ford Foundation mm -hmm. and uh, we definitely want to continue to share because uh, I can tell that you have so much more to tell us all about your grandparents and what they would have been able to accomplish mm -hmm. and how they were able to change what happened in, in terms of blackness and Caribbean um, resilience and so on in the in the lifting up Ethiopia, Ethiopia. Yeah. and lifting up not just education but Pioneer. also gender equality women yeah. in Ethiopia Certainly that's the contribution that Bajans have made absolutely yeah. so again thank you so much for coming in thank you all so right much. good start for today with a wonderful history lesson they say you don't know where you're going unless you know 
where you come from, where you come from. So good stuff. All right, so coming up, we're talking about the Faculty of Humanities and Education, and we're also introducing you to some of the swim team who will be representing Barbados at the upcoming Carifta Games. Stay with us. Ethiopia, the land of our fathers, the land where the gods love to be. As storm cloud at night suddenly gathers, our armies come rushing to thee. We must in the fight be victorious. Tune into CBC Newsnight for the NISS Business Report, a comprehensive look at the local, regional, and international business world every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday during CBC Newsnight. Brought to you by the National Insurance and Social Security Service. More than a contribution, it's your lifeline. Every night, we bring you a complete look at the weather forecast because keeping you safe and informed is our top priority. The CBC Weather Report, brought to you by Ace Agent B Hardware, the helpful hardware. From the beautiful shores of the Gem of the Caribbean, Barbados, home of the amazing Harrison's Cave, the tantalizing Oyston's Bay Garden, our historic garrison, the indigenous road tennis, and the friendliest people in the world, we are 94.7 FM, the ultimate Bajan experience. School sports is in full swing as the athletes are gearing up for the 2024 Power A Dasani BSAT Championships. Tune into CBC Sports Night with me, Anmar Goodrich Boyce, this and every Tuesday and Thursday for Athlete in the Spotlight. Sponsored by Power A, pause is power, and Dasani, live first, Dasani after. The race is on. Oh. Who will be victorious in the Dasani Power Aid Barbados Secondary Schools Athletics Championships? Stay tuned to find out. Live coverage of the action will be brought to you on this station from March 20th to 22nd. Dasani Power Aid BSAC. Sponsored by the Student Revolving Loan Fund, Great Health Works, and CG United. <laughs> The facts say Morning Barbados reaches an audience of over 50,000 and Newsnight reaches over 56,000. It's simple. When you advertise, you're getting your message to over 50,000 of your potential customers. Make the call to CBC Sales Department today and watch your business grow. Contact us at 467-5559 or email marketing at cbc.bb. Okay, so it's a beautiful day here in Barbados. We had some drizzles yesterday, but bright sunshine today. Of course, we don't mind the rain because that means that the plants are getting watered and everything else that needs to be watered across the land. We don't like the uh, grass looking too brown, you know? Then we start to complain, but uh, we definitely have a balanced environment, which is what we love. We can also do 
with a little bit more rain. We need that uh, for our environment to thrive specifically because a lot of people say we're water scarce. I always say people say because, you know, we kind of think we're surrounded by water. How could it be water scarcity? But hey, the experts know what they're talking about. So yesterday we told you all about the Faculty of Humanities and Education at UWE Cave Hill, and they're celebrating Open Week, what they're calling Taster Week. It's an opportunity for us to get out, uh, go to the campus, engage with uh, those members of that faculty, some of the students, and of course some partners who are coming in as well. So you're not only getting an opportunity to engage with them on campus, but they're also stepping out and coming out into the community, like they are today. So help me welcome of course, Dr. Verna Knight, who is coordinator of the Bachelor of Education program at UEK Phil. She's also a lecturer, and she's brought along Tiwana Branker, who's a student in early childhood care and education, that program. So welcome. Good to have both of you with us. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Let's start with you, Dr. Knight. Uh, let's talk a little bit about this particular program, the Bachelor of Education program, which you coordinate and how you came to be coordinator of this program. Uh, well, well, let's start with a little bit about the, the program itself. Um, we offer a range of bachelors of education specializations, um, not just for Barbados students, Barbadian students, but students across the Eastern Caribbean. Um, some persons are not aware that we actually offer a franchise version of the program through our colleges, the teacher training colleges in St. Vincent, in St. Lucia, and several other Caribbean islands, St. Kitts, um, are also part of our, one of the countries who provide one of our offerings. But here in Barbados, we offer the specializations in a number of core areas. Um, early childhood care and education is one of our flagship programs, but we also have um, the Bachelors of Education in Special Needs um, area, uh, which is, of course, one that is also in high demand. Um, and then, of course, we have the, the offerings in specialization areas, content areas like language arts, like mathematics, like social studies, like science education as well. Um, and so uh, it has been a, a program that has endured throughout the years. Um, we are currently doing some revision on some of the content areas, but our, our early childhood care and education program is one of the flagship ones that have been increasing in enrollment over the years. And so that's why we brought um, Tijuana to share with you a little bit about the program. Um, I have been involved as a coordinator for at least, I think it's, it's almost eight years now. Mm -hmm. um, it's been quite a while, but we tend to, the coordinator um, position isn't fixed to one individual, but from time to time, different members of staff will take it on. So I, am, I just happen to be the member of staff for the last few years who've been working with this program um, at hand. Eight years is, is hardly a time to time. <laughs> 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 However, I, I understand that. Uh, so Tiwana, you said you were always interested in education. Yeah. So you saw this as an opportunity to really jump into it. Interesting that you started in 2019. So I'm interested in hearing about that journey. Well, when I started the program, I always knew that I wanted to teach, but I didn't know where to start. When I first saw the outline of the program and what they were offering, I said, this is so extensive. I want to be a part of this. <laughs> and it was a very, very good step in terms of starting my career in teaching because I felt as though it gave me a bit of everything to get started. All right, well, that, that's a wonderful summary and uh, a great testimonial for the program as well. So it started you in the teaching profession as well? It did because as soon as I got through with my practicum, which is a part of the program, because we get the theory, but the practicum allows you to be in the classroom, not in the classroom alone, because great teachers need mentors. It allows you to be in the classroom supervised. So while I was in the classroom, I had a mentor teacher, and I also had a supervisor. So they assisted with the planning and classroom management, best practices. So it was, it was good. In, in, from that aspect. What do you think has made this program so popular? Um, I'm hearing about so many people now who are interested in the early childhood education as opposed to what we heard in the past, which right. was maybe a diploma in education, right. uh, things of that nature. Right. Well, well the, 
One of the great things about this early childhood care and education program is the fact that it includes the practicum that Tiwana talks about. Um, the, uh, the rest of our bachelors of education specializations have always required that you are teacher trained from Erdiston or any other teacher training institution across the region and then you come into the program. Um, in this case, the early childhood care and education program, um, it, it provides the practicum as part of the teaching experience. And so persons don't have to go to Erdiston first to come into the early childhood care and education program, but they come and they are certified as part of the training. So they don't have to leave UE and return back to Erdiston to do a diploma, for example, but the teacher training aspect is built into the program. And that's one of the things we always emphasize for our students because it, it, take, it requires them to complete at least 50 hours in the classroom, observing teachers, working along with mentor teachers, being supervised, planning lessons, teaching lessons, etc. And they always complain, of course, you know, that it's really rigorous and it's a lot of work and they can't sleep at night with all the planning that they have to do. And, and, and we you tell them with a smile. I, I, I do, because I tell them, I said, the rigor is what's important for the program. Okay. Um, one of, the, com one of the, com the, the questions they always ask us, well, do I need to go to Erdogan? And we say, no, we have guaranteed the, the government of the Caribbean that, that we will make sure that the practicum is equivalent to that which is, is done at the teacher, tra teacher training institutions. So the same 50-week training, training that is done, the 50 hours that is done in the classroom as part of the associate degree in any teacher training college in the Caribbean is the same thing that is built into this early childhood program. So if we lessen it, the rigor in any way, it undermines the quality of the program, and so we can't do that. But the beautiful thing is when we hear testimonies like Tijuana's who have been engaged in the practicum and come out at, at the end who talks to us about the feedback from employers, you know, when they go into interviews and they, they open their teaching portfolios and they show them the quality of work they've been doing, you know, how, how wonderful the experience is for them as they're validated, but also how impressed those, those employers are. It, it makes us, um, it, it strengthens our faith in the program and it helps other students who hear those testimonies to understand the value and why they're putting so much work into it. Now, Dr. Knight, you also mentioned that the program is not only available here in Barbados, no. but on other campuses as well. I'm intrigued to find out how things transitioned post-2019. Uh, was it already in the digital space or did you have to do some shuffling to be able to accommodate students? Well, the Bachelor's of Education program is a little bit different from the Master's uh, in that it is the franchise nature of the program means that it's delivered by the faculty in the teacher training institutions in those countries that offer that franchise option. So they actually so they work with a lead lecturer on campus. So all of the courses they're expected to take on campus, there's a lead lecturer who has responsibility for working with a lecturer in the country, and they share their weekly plans, the lessons. We have our e-learning system where students are added automatically, and so they get to share in assignments, submissions, etc. They have access to the very same resources that our students on campus have, and we're able to manage it. There, there were, of course, um, there, well, there were not many hiccups for us because we were already using the learning system at Cave Hill by the time we came on. And so Tiwana will tell you, she certainly had some courses to take during COVID, one with me as well. And we just seamlessly moved into the online space and we had Zoom and we had our lecturers there. We, they had the presentations and everything. So it wasn't as difficult for us um, as it was perhaps for the basic programs like primary and secondary at all. Wow. Uh, how do you think this program uh, focusing more heavily on um, early childhood care and education has shaped your view of how we need to educate our young children. Well, this program really sets the stage. One of the things is theory informs practice. So when you get to the classroom, you're not doing what everyone else is doing. You're doing what you've been instructed to do in the program at Kayfield. So if I have a class of children that are very unsettled, and I must say, where I teach now is a school um, for special education. Those children all are on the spectrum for something. In the program, there's a course called Introduction to Special Education. When I went into the classroom, I did not go only with my understanding of how to teach, I was prepared to handle that autistic child. I was prepared to handle that child with the dyslexia and the ADHD because I was informed of how to do it um, in the classroom at KFO. So the program puts you in a position that you are comfortable and capable of handling whatever comes in the classroom.
That's beautiful. You're also offering programs up to doctoral level. level. Yes. Uh, so talk to me some more about how they're being received. Uh, well, those, w the master's program, the postgraduate program, we offer a, a master's in education, an MED, and we also offer well, a number of specializations. And of course, we offer the MPhil and the PhD programs. And we've been seeing an intake, a, a, an increasing enrollment numbers. Um, we are, at the, at the School of Education, we have one of the largest um, group of students in the master's program and the MPhil and PhD programs. Um, we offer them in a range of areas. We offer them in um, curriculum studies, in education leadership, social context and education policy, um, inclusive education, language arts, um, science and technology education, psychology of education. So almost every area you can think of um, where you need a master professional teacher, we have a, a, a master's program um, for you, a one year full time, um, two years part time. Um, that a teacher or somebody interested in moving up to that level um, can engage in. And of course, we have a way of our MPhil and our, and our um, PhD programs for persons who want to move up to doctorate, uh, MPhil or doctorate level. We have those, and we've been seeing a lot of students moving up who've done bachelor's with us and have moved on to do master's and are now in the PhD programs, for example. All right, excellent. Uh, for you, Ms. Pranker, uh, what was it like managing uh, moving forward with your studies and regular life because I think a lot of the times that's what uh, really guides any decision by someone who might have say a bachelor's or a master's and they want to move up to the next level. Uh, we heard how rigorous the program is. Don't look over there at the lecturer but tell us what it was like kind of balancing things. It certainly sounds like it was quite the challenge. Yes it was definitely a pro it is a definitely a program where you have to manage your time. While you are going through your course courses, it's fine. When you get to that practicum, where you go into the classroom, I'm telling you, it's going to take all out of you. But the support that you usually have is great. So even when I felt overwhelmed, I could go to my mentor teacher or my, my supervisor and say, look, I'm not getting through here. And they were able to help. But definitely, you have to plan. You have to know that you are in this year program for three, four years, depending whether you're part-time or full-time. And you have to plan. When you're given assignments, you have to ensure that you go through the assignments and understand them. What I want to say, though, is the fact that these are teachers. They know how it is to be a student. It is a very practical program. So a lot of what you do happens through the theory so you don't get to say, oh, I just have to write 500 words. No. You have to plan a lesson, get some children from your community, teach them, get a feel of it. So from that perspective, it doesn't feel as though there's a the theory and then there's the practice. Because all of what we are doing is constantly equipping us so that we can handle the pressures as they come. I'm glad that you said that because it's very important for education to, to kind of be on trend, yeah. if we can call it that. Mm -hmm. And there, there have been so many things that have happened with education and, and things that we've learned throughout the years. Mm -hmm. I most certainly did not grow up hearing about all of these conditions, mm -hmm. uh, ADHD and um, autism. autism at this level. Yes. Um, so I, I know that a lot of these are maybe not new things, mm -hmm. but uh, the diagnoses mm -hmm. are certainly new. So it shows that you must pivot in able to be able to present a program to potential teachers that's relevant yes. and works for students. Mm -hmm. and, and we've certainly been doing that. Um, as a matter of fact, I, I would have mentioned that we are engaged in revising our content program, content specializations um, in the B.Ed program. And what we did was over the last three years, right through COVID, we were engaged with some external cons uh, um, consultants, etc., who worked along with us. And the aim has been to design the rest of our programs similarly along the lines of the, of the early childhood care and education program to ensure that it's practice-based, yes. to increase opportunities for students to be exposed very early to visiting classrooms, observing teachers, even before they go into the teacher training practicum, to make sure that they have a very clear understanding of what those expectations are, what those challenges are of Caribbean schools and of Caribbean, what is required of Caribbean teachers. And so we are now using the term adaptive expert to use to refer to the kind of teacher we are trying to design because the classroom today is very diverse. Yes. It's not the same as, as it was um, when I began teaching. 
um, certainly um, 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 in, in, in 2001. It's a completely different um, 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 classroom today. And so we are, we are seeking to design um, programs that are practice-based to respond to the need for that kind of adaptive expert. Well, that, that absolutely says it all. An adaptive expert, if you have that person in the classroom, then you know for sure you're getting the delivery of the type of education and engagement that you need to, to help our children be the best that they can be. I want to thank you so much, Dr. Knight. Uh, Dr. Knight is coordinator of the Bachelor of Education program at UE Cave Hill, and she's been filling in for the last eight years. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm kidding. She's also a lecturer, and Tiwana Branker is a student in early childhood care and education for that program. And, uh, you know, it's refreshing to have a student come in and share their experience and how uh, it impacted them or how the program still is impacting you. So congratulations, and I wish you the best on Open Week and Taster Week as you continue to engage with the community. Of course, we, we've shared uh, the, all the ways that you will continue to engage and interact with the community over the next few days. Thank you, all right, so, well, much. Thank you, thank so, you much. so much. It's time for another break, but stay here on Morning Barbados. So much more is to come that you don't want to miss. Morning, morning. Every night, we bring you a complete look at the weather forecast because keeping you safe and informed is our top priority. The CBC Weather Report, brought to you by Ace Agent B Hardware, the helpful hardware. From the beautiful shores of the Gem of the Caribbean, Barbados, home of the amazing Harrison's Cave, the tantalizing Oyston's Bay Garden, our historic garrison, the indigenous road tennis, and the friendliest people in the world. We are 94.7 FM, the ultimate Bajan experience. School sports is in full swing as the athletes are gearing up for the 2024 Power A Dasani BSAT Championships. Tune in to CBC Sports Night with me, Anmar Goodrich Boyce, this and every Tuesday and Thursday for Athlete in the Spotlight. Sponsored by Power A, pause is power, and Dasani, live first, Dasani after. The race is on. Who will be victorious in the Dasani Power Aid Barbados Secondary Schools Athletics Championships? Stay tuned to find out. Live coverage of the action will be brought to you on this station from March 20th to 22nd. Dasani Power Aid BSAC. Sponsored by the Student Revolving Loan Fund, Great Health Works, and CG United. <laughs> The facts say Morning Barbados reaches an audience of over 50,000 and Newsnight reaches over 56,000. It's simple. When you advertise, you're getting your message to over 50,000 of your potential customers. Make the call to CBC Sales Department today and watch your business grow. Contact us at 467-5559 or email marketing at cbc.bb. to CBC Newsnight for the NISS Business Report, a comprehensive look at the local, regional, and international business world every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday during CBC Newsnight. Brought to you by the National Insurance and Social Security Service. More than a contribution, it's your lifeline. Every night, we bring you a complete look at the weather forecast. Because keeping you safe and informed is our top priority. The CBC Weather Report, brought to you by Ace Agent B Hardware, the helpful hardware. From the beautiful shores of the Gem of the Caribbean, Barbados, home of the amazing Harrison's Cave, 
the tantalizing Oystens Bay Garden, our historic garrison, the indigenous road tennis, and the friendliest people in the world. We are 94.7 FM, the ultimate Bayesian experience. School sports is in full swing as the athletes are gearing up for the 2024 Power A Dasani BSAT Championships. Tune into CBC Sports Night with me, Anmar Goodrich Boyce, this and every Tuesday and Thursday for Athlete in the Spotlight. Sponsored by Power A, pause is power, and Dasani, live first, Dasani after. The race is on. Who will be victorious in the Dasani Power Aid Barbados Secondary Schools Athletics Championship? Stay tuned to find out. Live coverage of the action will be brought to you on this station from March 20th to 22nd. Dasani Power Aid BSAC. Sponsored by the Student Revolving Loan Fund, Great Health Works, and CG United. <laughs> The facts say Morning Barbados reaches an audience of over 50,000 and Newsnight reaches over 56,000. It's simple. When you advertise, you're getting your message to over 50,000 of your potential customers. Make the call to CBC Sales Department today and watch your business grow. Contact us at 467-5559 or email marketing at cbc.bb. All right, welcome back to Morning Barbados. Always good to have you in company for those of you who have to get out of the house. I know some days it's really a challenge to get through the door, so I certainly hope that's not you. Today, uh, we have some wonderful young people joining us. I always love to speak with students, but these ones, they're bringing home some medals for Barbados. Easter weekend, they're going out as a part of the Corifta team, the Corifta swim team. So congratulations are in order to all three of you. We have Sanaya Menes, Mihail Sobers, and Sarah Bartlett joining us first up. So congrats, guys. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah, that didn't sound like a real, you know. <laughs> Come on, you can be excited about, about making the team. Now for you, Sarah, I'm told you've been swimming from the age of three. So this must mean a great deal. I know that you've been competing competitively. So this most certainly is not, uh, you know, the beginning of your illustrious career. Uh, so talk to me about how you feel to be able to make another Carifta team. Um, well, this would be my second time um, making the Carifta team. Um, when I started out at the age of three, I was mainly swimming in the ocean for about like six, six seven years. And then I switched to the pool at the age of 11. Um, and I wasn't always like, it was more of like a decision by my parents because like, they saw the potential that I had. I wasn't the most determined or the most committed. It was more, I was doing it because my parents wanted to keep me engaged in sports. But I think around the age of 13, 14, so only like recently because I'm only 15 now, um, I started like actually like naturally falling in love with the water and actually loving the sport just for me. I wanted to compete at a higher level. So I qualified for Griff to last year and now second time qualifying freestyle. Oh, that's wonderful stuff. You specialize in the freestyle in the events? Freestyle events yes, so uh, do you think that that was kind of guided by but your love for the open water? Well, so yeah, I think the reason why freestyle is my main show is because from swimming in the ocean, you know, that's like the only show you would have done. So I think I'm just, I'm stronger at the freestyle. All right. Now, Mihail, you've been competing for some time. Uh, you competed for St. Gabriel's. Uh, so you're no stranger to competition. But what does it mean to you to be able to compete for your country? Well, for me, I feel really proud to compete for my country. And I would like to do it often, like more often, like to go to Olympics level and to follow my brother's footsteps. And you've also been a part of a previous Carifta swim team, 11 to 12. What was the experience like for you? I didn't really like the experience from last year because I didn't do as well as they wanted to. But this year, I have some goals that I would like to achieve. All right, so you're going to compete in a number of events, mm -hmm. um, seven events. Uh, how do you prep for that? I mean, 50-meter uh, backstroke, 100-meter backstroke, 200-meter um, backstroke, one, two, and four freestyle, and of course, the 200 individual medley as well. To do good in like, those events, I have a hard, like, 
morning sessions, evening sessions, and also it's not also about the training. You have to like eat properly and sleep properly, and yeah. I know all about that because sometimes you know everybody else at school, you know they're kind of doing their own thing. I remember I had a a, a, a swim athlete who went to school with me too, and. Uh, it was kind of difficult because everybody else seemed to be able to do what they wanted, but he had to be very strict in what he ate and how often he went to the pool. So is it that kind of difficult to Mihail? Yes, especially yeah. for athletes. I know. Now, you mentioned following in your brother's footstep, mm -hmm. footsteps, so talk a little bit more about that. My brother's Alex Silver, he's an Olympian, and a lot of people just, like compare me to him, but like I wouldn't really like that. And I would like to be better than him, so that's <laughs> Of course, <laughs> you know, so um, congratulations to Alex for giving you a little bit of the inspiration, just a tad. Mm -hmm. All right, good stuff. And Sanaya, you have some amazing highlights. 2022 Goodwill Games in Trin Trinidad, 2023 Carifta Games in Curacao, and uh, you're going to be representing for Barbados. Yeah, talk to me about your career in swimming. Um. I only saw, I started swimming when I was like eight, probably. Like I first started swimming when I was like four, but I didn't like it at all. I used to cry when I got in the water. So I actually started competitive swimming when I was eight or nine. And at first I don't think I really liked it that much. But when I got probably like 10, I started like maybe placing in races and making friends. So I started liking it more. And then when I actually started training harder and realized that I can actually do this up to like a higher level to actually travel places, I really liked it. And now that's what I'm really looking forward to in swimming. No siblings to compete with, right? Mm -hmm. or, or try to live up to, okay, good stuff. Mm -hmm. So I know that you have a few gold medals under your belt. Did you bring them with you today? No. No. When, listen, when you're coming to Morning Barbados, you have to bring all those medals. And when you guys come back from the games, you have to come medals in tow, all right? So that we can celebrate with you. So tell me a little bit about, um, you know, all of those wonderful national gold medals that you've won. Um, I don't really remember what events <laughs> I really saw before, but I'm a breaststroker, so the races that I probably did place in were breaststroke and in at Goodwill I think I came second in 50 breasts but that was a while ago. You'll remember more when you get a little older they're like oh maybe I came second <laughs> maybe I got a silver medal maybe I took gold yeah but you, you know we're happy whatever you guys are able to do whatever you're able to accomplish at the games because this is quite the accomplishment in and of itself being able to you know put on your cv and let employers and potential schools know that you've represented your country in this way so mihil you're going to bring home some medals That's easter true. weekend uh tell me about your pet event or events and uh what you hope to do in those events um this is just like my favorite event is the 400, and I have like a certain goal to achieve, which is under 430. In that event, it should give me a gold medal, and I'm really excited for that event. It's my favorite event. Excellent, under 430. What about you, Sarah? Um, I have my own personal goals too. Um, it's my first year in 15 and 17, so for me, coming into 15 and 17 is a bit intense because it's such a big age group, and I'm like one of the younger ones. But I think. Swimming has helped me learn that sometimes it's all about setting your own standards and being the best you can, knowing that when you come out of a race, you put your best foot forward. So I try to go in to all my meets with that same mindset um, because I think you can put in all the training you want, but if your mindset is not there, then you know it's, like it's all going to go to waste. So as they would have mentioned, like training, training, doing like the gym, eating right, stretching properly, making sure like your mind is at the right place coming into the games so that you can perform your best and make your country proud. All right, what about tr training for you? What's that like in prepping for these freestyle events? Um, well, right now I train like Friday mornings, Sunday mornings with the team and then on evenings. And for me right now, I'm focusing like a lot on my technique in the freestyle and perfecting that, my speed, 
um, listening attentively to my coach and what the pointers he's giving me. Um, and also eating right and limiting my time like on the screen, sleeping properly because it's going to be a long weekend for Easter, morning and evening, going back and forth to the pool. So it's all about getting that rest that your body needs and making sure your muscles are feeling good, you're feeling good and your mind is in the right place. All right, good stuff. So Naya, what about you? Uh, how are you prepping for the games? Uh, I know we talked a little bit about how you're eating and all of that, but how are you balancing school as well? Um, like right now, since it's the, well, it's closer to the end of the term, so I don't think that at school we have as much work as we normally do. But since like now I have to try and eat properly and sleep properly, um, I when I come home, I usually get ready for swimming and then go to swimming. So in that space, I usually try and start homework that I do have, if it's like anything online, because it's easier to do, because I could do it in the car or something. And then when I come home from swimming, I would eat and then do like whatever last bit of homework I have. Mm -hmm. And then it's time to get to bed on time. I feel like that's kind of hard because sometimes I may be distracted by people calling me, but Usually, I have to like put down my phone. <laughs> so the hardest thing is getting to bed on time and getting those friends off of the phone calling you. I absolutely understand. And um, you know, it's, it's, it's great to see all of you. Mihail, good luck. Thank you. Come back with those medals. I hope that you make that under 430 that you're hoping for. I hope so too. Yes, uh, I wish you all the best in those yeah. freestyle events. And of course, you, Sanaya, uh, we look forward to more gold. Thank you. Are you coming back as well? Be sure to bring them to Morning Barbados, okay? All right, so introducing you to some members of the Carifta swim team who will be representing Barbados this Easter weekend. Keep your eyes on them. Of course, it's Mihail Sobers, Sanaya Minnis, and Sarah Bartlett. When we come back, we're going to meet some more members of the Carifta team. They're also here, so stay with us. Morning, morning. Tune in to CBC Newsnight for the NISS Business Report. A comprehensive look at the local, regional, and international business world every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday during CBC Newsnight. Brought to you by the National Insurance and Social Security Service. More than a contribution, it's your lifeline. Every night, we bring you a complete look at the weather forecast. Because keeping you safe and informed is our top priority. The CBC Weather Report, brought to you by Ace Agent B Hardware, the helpful hardware. From the beautiful shores of the Gem of the Caribbean, Barbados, home of the amazing Harrison's Cave, the tantalizing Oyston's Bay Garden, our historic garrison, the indigenous road tennis, and the friendliest people in the world, we are 94.7 FM, the ultimate Bajan experience. School sports is in full swing as the athletes are gearing up for the 2024 Power A Dasani BSAT Championships. Tune in to CBC Sports Night with me, Anmar Goodrich Boyce, this and every Tuesday and Thursday for Athlete in the Spotlight. Sponsored by Power A, pause is power, and Dasani, live first, Dasani after. The race is on. Who will be victorious in the Dasani Power Aid Barbados Secondary Schools Athletics Championship? Stay tuned to find out. Live coverage of the action will be brought to you on this station from March 20th to 22nd. Dasani Power Aid BSAC. Sponsored by the Student Revolving Loan Fund, Great Health Works, and CG United. <laughs> The facts say Morning Barbados reaches an audience of over 50,000 and Newsnight reaches over 56,000. It's simple. When you advertise, you're getting your message to over 50,000 of your potential customers. Make the call to CBC Sales Department today and watch your business grow. Contact us at 467-5559 or email marketing at cbc.bb.
Tune in to CBC News Night for the NISS Business Report, a comprehensive look at the local, regional, and international business world every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday during CBC News Night. Brought to you by the National Insurance and Social Security Service. More than a contribution, it's your lifeline. Every night, we bring you a complete look at the weather forecast because keeping you safe and informed is our top priority. The CBC Weather Report, brought to you by Ace Agent B Hardware, the helpful hardware. From the beautiful shores of the Gem of the Caribbean, Barbados, home of the amazing Harrison's Cave, the tantalizing Oyston's Bay Garden, our historic garrison, the indigenous road tennis, and the friendliest people in the world, we are 94.7 FM, the ultimate Bajan experience. School sports is in full swing as the athletes are gearing up for the 2024 Power A Dasani BSAT Championships. Tune into CBC Sports Night with me, Anmar Goodrich Boyce, this and every Tuesday and Thursday for Athlete in the Spotlight. Sponsored by Power A, pause is power, and Dasani, live first, Dasani after. Morning, morning, morning. Meeting members of the Carifta Swim and Open Water team is what we love to do. And uh, we have some other members with us now on the set. Joining me around the table, Zachary Burt, uh, Kamisha Johnson, and Jaya Simmons. Good morning. Good morning. Certainly this is not too early to wake up. I was off uh, to the side telling Jaya, was it too early? No, but you guys get up early for school all the time, right? Yeah, I'm morning swimming mm -hmm. also. Pardon? I'm morning swimming. I'm also. morning swimming. So you are definitely morning people. So I want to start with you, uh, Zachary. Tell me a little bit about all you've been able to do. I know that this is not your first international competition. You've competed for Carifta. I believe this is your third time. Yes, please. This is uh, my you've, time. you've competed for CCAN. Uh, you were named most outstanding junior male swimmer and age group champion in 2021, 2023, and long and short course nationals and you have so many other accolades under your belt including being named victor ludorum at your interhouse swimming sports in 2022 and divisional champ and victor ludorum in 2023 so congratulations on, on all of those accomplishments and there are a whole lot more i just can't talk about all of them this morning uh, but you have a lot to be proud about so let's talk a little bit about your foray into swimming how did you get into swimming uh, I would imagine the parents did it because we always do. But then where did you decide, hey, this is something I love to do? Well, I used to swim in the beach, right, on like Saturdays. And then I used to play football a lot. Then eventually, like at my school, there was a learn to swim. And I went to that and then I got like ties with a coach. And my parents finalized some stuff and I was able to go swimming on like Wednesdays once a week and then eventually I started to swim more and more. I was not very good in the beginning but eventually you know you will get better. Let's talk about that eventually. When did you decide or when did you figure out okay well I might be good at this? Well in eight and under I made goodwill for the first time and when I did that I felt very elated you know and I was able to get to her place. So ever since then, I've just been trying to get medals, you know? That's beautiful stuff. And you know, you talk about it so casually, um, but it's wonderful that you love it and you continue to develop yourself. And now you continue to represent Barbados. Speaking of representing Barbados, Jaya, you hold a number of national records uh, for about eight events. So let's hear about, about you and this swimming. Where did it begin? And I mean, at 14 years old, you have quite a few accompli accomplishments under your belt so far. Um, I started, so I started swimming when I was five years old. I started to learn to swim with Pirate Swim Club. Um, my parents enrolled me in swimming because, well, my mom swam when she was younger, so it was kind of like, like I'm starting um, in like the family like um, business. But um, I started when I was five. I started to. I always liked swimming because 
um, a lot of my friends swam that I went to school with, so it was always like a fun sort of um, activity I used to do. But as I got older, I started to um, focus mainly on swimming because I did a lot of activities when I was younger. But when I was around maybe eight or nine, I started, or maybe ten, I started to focus mainly on swimming and training. Um, and I started to really perform, I would say, in nine to ten, um, and my early eleven to twelve days, and that's when I started to produce like a real love for the sport. Oh, that's excellent. And you've been excelling in an amazing way. What are the coaches telling you? What are the parents saying to you about uh, the prospects for swimming? Um, I think coaches, like, I've heard a lot of... Major the majority of what I've heard is if I just keep what I do... If I just keep doing what I'm doing, I can excel, and that's what I've been trying to do. Excellent. Now, Kamisha, you're an all-round athlete. I mean running, distances, that's kind of your thing. And you're actually last year's gold medal holder in the knapsack high jump, um, 10 to 12 age group athletic championships, yes? Yeah. All right, so talk to me. Um, you know, have you always been interested in, in sports at this level? Yeah, I've always been interested in sports because my brothers were doing sports, so like I was following after them. And I did sports for fun, and, and my mother did sports, and my family, a lot of my family did sports and stuff. Now, in addition to all of this running, because I see that your specialties are distance races. So the 8, the 15, cross country, um, and we mentioned that you do well at the high jump as well. But in swimming, I'm told that your favorites are butterfly, freestyle, backstroke. <laughs> I mean, that's just so, you know, how do you kind of gauge your tongue the many different sports that you do? Is there a favorite at this stage? Yeah, swimming is my favorite, best one. And like, I like swimming with my, my brothers and the people because I have fun with them and make fun memories with them. That's excellent. Now, you're one of these people who, I mean, when I look at what you love to do, we can't make any excuses about time management because somehow you manage to talk about your favorite gaming hobbies as well, Roblox, <laughs> Fortnite, Minecraft. So it's just about uh, a little bit of everything for you. What are you looking forward to most uh, in terms of swimming for representing Barbados coming up Easter weekend? I'm looking forward to make people happy and be able to beat my, my best times. And, and yeah. Do you have a pet event, a favorite event that you think you'll do exceptionally well in? Yeah, I have my my favorite event like, is fly, so like I think I will do good in fly because I train hard in fly. But breaststroke used to be my best stroke, but something happened, got messed up, so I changed it over to fly, and now I stayed on to fly. All right, good stuff. So you've represented Barbados, as we mentioned, for a few years, um, based on your experience before and going into the games with that experience, what are you hoping to change this time around? This time or around. Improve? This time around, I would like to change my diet because last year it was very bad because I don't really eat a lot of stuff. And like the entire competition, I was sick. But this year going in, I would like to change my diet, you know, make sure I use the adequate amount of vitamins and make sure I'm ready and confident for my races. All right, that's good. So I'm sure you will be. You know, they say hindsight is 2020. You've been there, so you know exactly where you want to go. And what about you, Jaya? Um, I would imagine there's a lot of pressure on your shoulders uh, with so many accomplishments um, behind and in front of you. Um, your pet events, what you're hoping to change or upgrade for this time? Um, I would say my pet events are. 50 freeze and the I am, I mean the individual medley events. Um, I like sprints, so like I like putting all of my energy into like a one like lap and um, so I'm excited for the 50 free and the 50 fly. Good stuff. Kimisha, what's it like when you 
are standing there waiting for the gun to go off? You know, is it nerve wracking? Uh, what are you thinking when, when you're waiting? Um, before the race, I'm nervous, but in my brain I say just do it and just run as best as you can. I don't overthink. I just tell myself to do it and, yeah. What about you, Zachary? Uh, before the race, I just say like a little prayer. And, you know, obviously I'm going to be nervous, but it's about after the race, you know. You're not going to want to go in and come last. You're going to want to go in and do your best and after you feel good. All right, good stuff. Uh, so we look forward to all that you do. I mean, this is an accomplishment already, making the team, um, you know, multiple times for most of you. Um, so interesting, Kamisha, that you still are into so many sports. Usually people have to kind of, you know, you have to pick one or two and go in that direction. So I'm happy that you're still able to, um, you know, involve yourself in other areas of sport as well. Uh, so congratulations, guys. Zachary Burke, Kamisha Johnson, Jaya Simmons. We look forward to you coming back with all those medals in tow. And if you need some help bringing them from the car, because there's so many medals, you know, just let me know beforehand and I'll come out and help you bring the medals in when you get back from Carifta, right guys? Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> all right, good. Have a wonderful day at school to all three of you. You too. Thank you. All right, and we look forward to having them back after Carifta to see exactly how they do. Whatever they do, we're going to be proud and cheering here in Barbados and for those of us who will be there for the meets. We'll be on the sidelines making sure that we let our students know that we are absolutely proud of them, whatever they're able to do at the upcoming Carifta Games. So it's time for another break. So it's budget time. We had the budget presentation from Prime Minister Mia Moore Motsley yesterday, went well into the evening period. Today we will hear from opposition leader Ralph Thorne. So very interesting times ahead. What we're going to do is try to dissect some of the new initiatives, uh, some of the old ones that have been revamped. And we're going to talk a little bit about how it will impact us as regular Barbadians. That's with Dr. Don Marshall. That's all coming up here on Morning Barbados. Stay with us. Morning, morning, morning. Good morning. Good morning to you. The race is on. Who will be victorious in the Dasani Power 8 Barbados Secondary Schools Athletics Championships? Stay tuned to find out. Live coverage of the action will be brought to you on this station from March 20th to 22nd. The Sunny Power 8 BSAC, sponsored by the Student Revolving Loan Fund, Great Health Works, and CG United. <laughs> The facts say Morning Barbados reaches an audience of over 50,000 and Newsnight reaches over 56,000. It's simple. When you advertise, you're getting your message to over 50,000 of your potential customers. Make the call to CBC Sales Department today and watch your business grow. Contact us at 467-5559 or email marketing at cbc.bb. to CBC Newsnight for the NISS Business Report. A comprehensive look at the local, regional, and international business world every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday during CBC Newsnight. Brought to you by the National Insurance and Social Security Service. More than a contribution, it's your lifeline. Every night, we bring you a complete look at the weather forecast because keeping you safe and informed is our top priority. The CBC Weather Report, brought to you by Ace Agent B Hardware, the helpful hardware. 
From the beautiful shores of the gem of the Caribbean, Barbados, home of the amazing Harrison's Cave, the tantalizing Oyston's Bay Garden, our historic garrison, the indigenous road tennis, and the friendliest people in the world. We are 94.7 FM, the ultimate Bajan experience. School sports is in full swing as the athletes are gearing up for the 2024 Power A Dasani BSAT Championships. Tune into CBC Sports Night with me, Anmar Goodrich Boyce, this and every Tuesday and Thursday for Athlete in the Spotlight. Sponsored by Power A, pause is power, and Dasani, live first, Dasani after. Morning, morning, morning. Good morning indeed. It's Tuesday, March 19th. Time for an update of the news here on Morning Barbados. Government will continue to support the relief of electricity bills. Prime Minister Mia Amomotli has announced that from April 1st, 2024 until September 30th, 2024, VAT reduction will be extended on electricity bills. Where residential customers will pay only 10% VAT it was on the first 250 kilowatt hours, sir, of electricity um, instead of the normal 17.5% VAT. Government will also be moving to alter the legislation governing electricity supply this year. Prime Minister Motley wants to see the rate reviews happen. She says Barbados cannot take years to have it happen when the last one was 13 years ago. We will have a new electricity supply bill before Parliament, and we will invite international experts shortly to review that draft bill and to make recommendations for updating our Utilities Regulation Act and our Fair Trading Commission Act. This is the time, sir, to deconstruct and reconstruct all of our regulatory processes that govern those pieces of legislation to ensure that Barbados' regulatory environment is fit for purpose Meantime, shoppers are being urged to be more discerning as to where they buy their family's food. Prime Minister Motley says government's monitoring of supermarkets has shown that prices on food items are lower than there were two years ago. Now, I am not a fool. I know that even though we have reduced the port charges twice in a year, that there will be ways that people will find to try to boost it back up to the consumer again. And that is why I'm asking Bajans to open their eyes, to look at the information we're going to put out there. We have information on all the major supermarkets, A1, Chanel, Cherish, Eddie's, Fair Deals, Jordan's, Lionel Seahill, Massey, People's Mart, Popular Discount, Price Low, Roxy, Savings Plus, Try Smart. And Mr. Speaker, if you could see off of this thing, I have to print it for you. You will see that everything that is underlined in red is where the prices are the same or lower than they were in July 2022 because of the actions that we have taken and because of also the reduction in shipping prices and other things. Now, after the introduction of a national minimum wage three years ago, Prime Minister Motley says it will be reviewed by the minimum wage board. She says inflation is rising and the rates for those at the bottom needs to be addressed it will be required to review the rate which currently stands at $8.50 per hour and then of course $9.25 per hour for security officers. Given the rise in inflation, there is no doubt that there will be some adjustment. However, in order to protect those persons at the bottom of the play scale, I am proposing that going forward, we will index the minimum wage, thereby making provision for an annual increase in accordance with inflation but with a full review every five years to be done to ensure whether the adjustment needs to be more than inflation. Of course, we continue coverage of the response to the budget later this afternoon around 3 o'clock. We will also be covering uh, the sports action happening at the Usain Bolt Sports Complex. Do join us for the news throughout the day 
or tune in for the world at one via our radio network of stations, 98.1 The One, 94.7 and 100.7 FM. Morning Barbados continues after this. Morning, morning, morning. Good morning. Good morning to you. The race is on. Who will be victorious in the Dasani Power 8 Barbados Secondary Schools Athletics Championships? Stay tuned to find out. Live coverage of the action will be brought to you on this station from March 20th to 22nd. Dasani Power 8 BSAC, sponsored by the Student Revolving Loan Fund, Great Health Works, and CG United. <laughs> The facts say Morning Barbados reaches an audience of over 50,000 and Newsnight reaches over 56,000. It's simple. When you advertise, you're getting your message to over 50,000 of your potential customers. Make the call to CBC Sales Department today and watch your business grow. Contact us at 467-5559 or email marketing at cbc.bb. to CBC Newsnight for the NISS Business Report. A comprehensive look at the local, regional, and international business world every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday during CBC Newsnight. Brought to you by the National Insurance and Social Security Service. More than a contribution, it's your lifeline. Every night, we bring you a complete look at the weather forecast because keeping you safe and informed is our top priority. The CBC Weather Report, brought to you by Ace Agent B Hardware, the helpful hardware. From the beautiful shores of the Gem of the Caribbean, Barbados, home of the amazing Harrison's Cave, the tantalizing Oyston's Bay Garden, our historic garrison, the indigenous road tennis, and the friendliest people in the world. We are 94.7 FM, the ultimate Bajan experience. School sports is in full swing as the athletes are gearing up for the 2024 Power A Dasani BSAT Championships. Tune into CBC Sports Night with me, Anmar Goodrich Boyce, this and every Tuesday and Thursday for Athlete in the Spotlight. Sponsored by Power A, pause is power, and Dasani, live first, Dasani after. Morning, morning, morning. So Professor Don Marshall is a renowned expert in development studies and political sciences with a specialization in international political economy. So with his wealth of knowledge and experience, he's well equipped to analyze and provide some insights on the recent budget presented by Prime Minister Mia Amor Motley uh, just last evening. So good morning. Welcome. Good to have you with us. Good morning, Marshall. It's good to be here again. All right. So uh, let's get into it. So. What are your initial impressions of the budget as presented by Prime Minister last evening? I believe that the Prime Minister was eager to get across a message to Barbadians about the country's performance under her stewardship over the last five and a half years or so. And um, she used the opportunity to uh, once again, but this time to me with a renewed vigor, to defend the record of the administration, uh, to show that it's a humane, caring government, and to introduce measures that would bring relief to white cross sections of the population. She sought to respond to um, criticisms and, and lay impressions of how the government has been performing. And I think she has an eye too for the debate that will come in terms of the response of the opposition leader and what she 
would want to put across in defense of any um, attack on, on the government. There seemed to be a heavy focus on trying to move public servants, especially a little further forward, um, uh, more or less enfranchising them somewhat uh, in police officers and teachers and people of that strata. Um, how do you think that will go down generally with uh, Barbadians? I think the policemen would be, the category of policemen, uh, sergeants, detectives, etc., will be happy to see that there is um, some address of their um, uh, financial packages, their salaries and allowances and so on. Um, the criminal investigation allowance is an interesting one as well. Um, and there are some non-refundable tax credits for research and development around a range of issues. Um, and there are uh, some benefits in there as well for uh, people with disability. Uh, also, she's expanded the category of those with disability to include those that are suffering from cerebral palsy and other related debilitating conditions. Uh, I think it was a deliberate attempt to uh, broaden the net um, at a time when the policy space, at first glance, will seem a bit limited because we're in an IMF program. And I think she wanted to demonstrate that there is still some considerable policy autonomy and dexterity that she has within her reach as the Minister of Finance to be able to positively affect people's lives by way of providing relief and a protective response. The proof, though, is in, uh, in the testing in, in terms of is this far enough? Has this gone far enough to relieve grievances, to re relieve um, pleas for reduction in cost of living, etc.? Um, but that is for different sections of the population to analyze for themselves. And, and also the, the question of uh, national development of where we're going, I see that there is some, again, some non-refundable tax credits to incentivize projects that would uh, bring about, uh, you know, greater use of alternative energy. Uh, those are engaged in research and development and also can see themselves benefiting from reverse tax credits. Uh, there are some interesting things in the budget that um, you couldn't fault it in terms of its spread and reach. The question is how far down would it go to incentivize? Um, we're still hearing the moaning about the, the fact that the, the banks are not taking advantage of their liquidity and investing, reinvesting the in the, in, the, in the government bonds and securities, but they remain skittish, they remain nervous about going that route again, given the haircut experience of 2018. Uh, in layman terms, I'm referring to the debt restructuring. So, and that's a, a, a kind of a tightrope dance that they saw being performed, and they see being performed by the Prime Minister and the um, and financial institutions uh, for all that's being said and for the positive spin, they're not sufficiently confident to buy into government bonds and the boss program and, and other things. Um, and this is where um, it's a litmus test of exactly how confident uh, different sections of the financial and investment community are in um, uh, going that route again. All right. Um, you know, based on the presentation, directly on the PM's presentation, it seemed as though um, there was more or less, uh, in talk talking about the banking sector, uh, that some of these measures were disadvantaging a certain segment of the population. Um, so it's definitely going to be interesting to see how things shape up in time. Um, what do you think, though, was missing from, from the budget overall? Well, uh, you said it was wide-ranging. However, mm -hmm. you know, what do you think was missing? Revenue impact, the cost of these different measures, the cost of the sweep of initiatives and measures introduced. Um, so it needed to connect back to the estimates for there to be a squaring of the circle in the analysis. But I think the, the Prime Minister, I wouldn't say was distracted, no. I think she came with a particular message that she wanted to deliver. But Barbados would have probably wanted to hear what's the cost impact of all these measures. Um, because she did say no new taxes. And um, in her um, welcome style, uh, she was able to deliver with impact. 
but ultimately um, without a revenue analysis, a revenue impact analysis, we're, it's left now for uh, those trained in that area to perhaps go delve into an analysis of what, what this actually means uh, in terms of the shortfall in expenditure or um, whether or not some of these programs could in fact see the light of day within the um, fiscal year. She did mention some measures that will exceed beyond the fiscal year. So I'm not talking about those. I'm talking about those that uh, relate to what she's seeking to have implemented within the, the fiscal year 24-25. Share your thoughts on the changes that will come to con concessions. I know that featured heavily in the Prime Minister's presentation as to you know the way they will treat to concessions that are already in place and uh, how that will be changed up um, you know as as we move into a new financial year are uh, for people who would have had concessions in place for a number of years uh, I, I believe she mentioned that some people still have them on typeset paper and they come you know with them in hand saying this is what I have but they're going to have to live up to certain obligations to be able to maintain the concessions and, and even get them in some instances? Well, I think it's all part and parcel of uh, improving budgetary efficiency and allocation. And um, the Prime Minister cannot be faulted for bringing order to this, to this, um, this section. Uh, you know, as she well explained, their concessions, she calls it tax expenditure management, but basically it's about bringing order to those that are custom benefiting from concessions, uh, particularly businesses and so on. You know, make your application, uh, detail in that application, you're going to detail what is it you're seeking to do and how the public will benefit from um, the, the, the concessions that you will receive. And you have to live up to that. And um, as she said, this was lagging for over 27 years. And um, I, I think it's, it's to be commended. It's, I don't think it's anything that um, she would, uh, as Minister of Finance, fetch criticism for. It will irritate and humbug some, <laughs> some businesses because it's more paperwork. They'll call it red tape. But the state must do what it has to do to clean up and to, to, to um, bring efficiency to the administration of their concessions and to hold uh, these businesses and other beneficiaries accountable. So I, I commended and applauded that particular initiative. What about uh, the approach, which seems to be an approach to um, address directly the ease of doing business in Barbados, the establishment of a new state-owned enterprise to kind of take in hand everything to do with business from getting it off the ground all the way through to establishing and developing those businesses. How do you see that shaping how we're able to uh, maybe attract uh, new businesses in and outside of Barbados? You know, there's this knee-jerk <laughs> response whenever various administrations approach um, investors, local and foreign, about facilitating the ease of doing business. But Barbados, too, is a country that seeks to offer uh, a range of international business services to a non-resident clientele. And we have to be very vigilant with um, our due diligence. And uh, as much as you would see the clamor for a reduction in the paperwork, etc., Barbados has to comply with international standards and it has to blaze as well, be a trendsetter in setting standards. So those countries who brag that you can set up a business and run it in 24 hours, they're normally red flagged for, um, you know, malfeasance. And other kinds of, of uh, nefarious activities that also due diligence. Um, Barbara's reputation is too precious to, to cashier away by just removing layers and layers. We can only improve on the efficiency. And uh, the next point that we want to make about that is sometimes the, the concessions by way of giving an ease on, on doing business is not met with the kind of investment in our youth, the kind of investment in jobs, the kind of 
uh, expectations governments have, successive governments, not just this government. Uh, so there's a lot, particularly for the local private sector, to accept when it comes to when you weigh in the balance, successive governments and what we've been trying to do to facilitate the ease of business and the return, the quid pro quo. Uh, you know, I, when, it's not just the banking sector the Prime Minister is appealing to, to make investment. They are also in its bonds and securities, but it's also inadvertently appealing to the private sector locally to do more. It's coming up with incentives and so on to do more. And you'll find that will increase because the reality is that when you're in an IMF program, there isn't the policy space for the state to do more than offer tax credits um, and tax rebates. They could only, part of the phrase, nickel and dime in order to incentivize. Because certain kinds of subsidies, certain kinds of state actions are decried by the credit rating institutions, decried by the IMF when they do the annual um, audits. And, uh, and as part of a program, you're going to be limited in the range of how we can subsidize and give rise to certain kinds of entrepreneurial activity. You're not to be in there, as it were, as a state. So the state posture currently would be one where we have tried to facilitate this ease of doing business, but more and more the Prime Minister and other, uh, others, you'll find it says the, the academic community exhorts the private sector to do more. You'll find um, different civil society organizations will be exhorting the private sector to do more. And, um, and I think that that will continue to be the case. Um, but, you know, every effort to ease business is welcome. But the reality is that we, on the balance sheet, there's been more by way of doing that, and less by way of investment in the economy. All right, so we heard a lot about uh, health care. As you mentioned, uh, there was quite a move to kind of address a lot of the criticisms that the government has been having. So as we close, uh, the impact that you think um, the changes will have on um, the electricity bill and the reduction of uh, value-added tax in the installation of the water tanks and septic tanks and electrical pumps, things like that that will benefit householders. Yeah, I think the proof is in the, oh, what's the phrase, huh? in the eating, <laughs> something of that sort. Um, look, I think Barbados were looking for a, a sweeping measure that would bring about, that would show tangible si signs of tax relief. If you read the details of the budget, there are some uh, reductions, the, the re uh, reducing the VAT from 17.5% to 10%. 10 percent on I think the first 250 mm -hmm. kilowatts of yes. electricity is an ease but that's not going to be read that way unless you see it reflected in your bill in the next two months um, and ultimately it's about impressions uh, will the impression that there's more than one Barbados two Barbadoses will that go away with the eventually over the next two, three years as, this, as the measures introduced as this budget begin to roll out and begin, and begin to impact people, will that scotch that? Will it scotch the questions of who benefits and uh, how, how um, different populations may benefit more under this government than, than others? There are different uh, ways of addressing this budget um, by way of its differential impact. But I think it all has to do with how people see their um, bills. And uh, she speaks about the supermarket experience, but some person's supermarket experience may vary from the Prime Minister's impression. Um, when they're going to purchase food, uh, different businesses, you know, uh, the costs are really, really high. Um, bread, flour, and so on. But some of these things we can't control, and the Prime Minister might not have spoken about it, but there's something called imported inflation. So. All right, so what can we look forward to this evening for the reply from now opposition leader? I think he has to put, well, I, I, I don't want to give free advice, but he has to be, uh, I think he's being baited to defend the record of the Democratic Labour Party. He will probably do well not to do so. Uh, and use the opportunity to outline what he imagines are the challenges Barbados face, uh, why the picture is not as rosy, 
as the Prime Minister might have painted it, if he wants to do that, and what a Ralph Thorne-led Democratic Labour Party give us a glimpse of what that would mean developmentally. In terms of the revenue impact, perhaps you should delve into asking the question, what is the real cost of these measures in the budget? But um, like the Prime Minister, he's an attorney, in uh, attorney by training. He's not a trained economist. And speaking, speaking in broad developmental terms, at any rate, uh, best helps the public to understand the nature of society economy and the challenges that they face. All right, I want to thank you for sharing with us, Professor Marshall. Mm -hmm. um, we certainly uh, would like to delve in a bit more. Um, sure. But with the limited time, uh, I think that you've shed some light on some of the areas uh, that we really should hone in on as average Barbadians. And we most certainly look forward to far more commentary as well um, on what's happening with the budget and now getting ready for the response from the opposition leader. So make sure you stay tuned to TV8 around 9 o'clock this morning. We're going to join sister station Q100.7 FM for their Talk About It presentation where Peter Wickham will be in the hot seat and most certainly talking about the budget presentation and of course looking forward to the 3 o'clock submission by the leader of the opposition. So that will be simulcast on TV8 as well as it will be live on Q100.7 FM. Again, thanks for your time, Dr. Marshall. It's no problem. All right, we're going to take a break and come back here on Morning Barbados. Sun high in the sky and lots to see and do, so stay with us. Morning, morning, morning. Good morning. Good morning to you. Tune into CBC Newsnight for the NISS Business Report. A comprehensive look at the local, regional, and international business world every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday during CBC Newsnight. Brought to you by the National Insurance and Social Security Service. More than a contribution, it's your lifeline. Every night, we bring you a complete look at the weather forecast. Because keeping you safe and informed is our top priority. The CBC Weather Report, brought to you by Ace Agent B Hardware, the helpful hardware. From the beautiful shores of the Gem of the Caribbean, Barbados, home of the amazing Harrison's Cave, the tantalizing Oyston's Bay Garden, our historic garrison, the indigenous road tennis, and the friendliest people in the world. We are 94.7 FM, the ultimate Bajan experience. School sports is in full swing as the athletes are gearing up for the 2024 Power A Dasani BSAT Championships. Tune into CBC Sports Night with me, Anmar Goodrich Boyce, this and every Tuesday and Thursday for Athlete in the Spotlight. Sponsored by Power A, pause is power, and Dasani, live first, Dasani after. The race is on. Who will be victorious in the Dasani Power Aid Barbados Secondary Schools Athletics Championships? Stay tuned to find out. Live coverage of the action will be brought to you on this station from March 20th to 22nd. Dasani Power Aid BSAC, sponsored by the Student Revolving Loan Fund, Great Health Works, and CG United. <laughs> The facts say Morning Barbados reaches an audience of over 50,000 and Newsnight reaches over 56,000. It's simple. When you advertise, you're getting your message to over 50,000 of your potential customers. Make the call to CBC Sales Department today and watch your business grow. Contact us at 467-5559 or email marketing at cbc.bb.
Good morning to you. We're in the last few minutes of Morning Barbados. Time flies when you're having fun, right? Uh, so it's time for a little bit of fun with Stoned with Cupid, Akeem Chandler Prescott. It's always good to see you. Likewise, always good to see you too. Good stuff. I think our first official meeting was through Beige to the World. Uh, Probably. In the midst of yeah. COVID, when we were doing the launch yeah. outside. And, yeah. You know, yeah, and I, I was so. so impressed from then. I mean, I'd seen you right. in other quarters before. But then in terms of that entire presentation, I love how you you engage and, and kind of experiment more or less with everything. Yes. So it's the backdrop, it, yeah. it's the words, it's uh, an entire presentation. So talk to me about uh, how you're kind of able to uh, bring about this amalgam of uh, photography and songwriting and um, bring about your expertise with creative directing yeah. uh, because all of that brings the bear when we see your presentation. Yeah, I try to make it as all-encompassing as possible. Uh, I'm a rapper, I'm a spoken word artist and I write outside with just poetry as well. I do short stories. I would love to write a novel if I have the time. So I think spoken word is a good catch-all where you could put drama, you could put music, you could put film, you could put photography, um, you could put as many things as you want to put in it. Also, I never, I always miss these performances, but the UE Dance Ensemble have danced to my poetry, where it's just word, and they choreographed to just word. So dance can be incorporated as well. I'm always doing something else whenever they're performing. But I, I, will, I like to pack in as many things as I can into the spoken word so we can make it competitive. And so when people think of Barbados spoken word, you know, it's at a certain level. I think it's very important. You've also been mentor to quite a few uh, upcoming artists. What does that mean in, in terms of what you do? Yeah, I, I, would have been, I would have taken quite a few young poets under my wing. I don't know if they see me as a official mentor, but I think it's important to instill that business ethic. In, inside the young poets and also make them realize that we need to look at this in a very holistic way. We need to consider the full meta practice of what it is that we're doing. So consider the economics of it, um, consider the emotional impact, the social impact, the personal impact that it may have on you, and then also on a wider scale, how do we contribute to the cultural landscape? How do we evolve the Barbados identity through spoken word, through poetry, and through literature. And then also too, you know, it, it always helps when you're multifaceted because you could cut down that operating cost, that operating expense, and you could also then create a new and innovative product as well. So uh, I try to pass on what I could pass on, and I also learn from them as I'm teaching them as well. A, a few years ago, through the development of the Cultural Industries Development Authority, and of course, before that, there were mm. a number of initiatives too, but I, I seem to recall that when that came into being, mm -hmm. uh, I felt as though there was a shift okay. toward mm. uh, even more support for the cultural industries, for, mm. um, for just different forms of expression. Yeah. What role do you think spoken word and poetry and this uh, form of expression has mm. had generally on the way that people view culture and cultural expression? Well, I think, you see, the thing about spoken word and poetry is that it happens in these niche spaces. So apart from the, well, I call them the big four that get out and perform a lot, like myself, Cindy, DJ, and Adrian, a lot of people may not be exposed to the other smaller pockets of spoken word. But we have a lot of people doing work to really change the way we view mental health, change the way we view things like depression, even drug abuse, drug usage. Um, we got some people doing a lot of work with reparations and the black identity, black consciousness, what it means to be a black Barbadian. So we have quite a few artists out here doing what you would call activism, where they're championing art, um, activist, activism and also art and fusing it and really combining it to create this socially conscious, thought-provoking product. Um, and it's, it's really entertaining and, and engaging to watch. Wonderful. You're going to be a part of Poetry, the event yes. that is coming up. I look forward yes, to yes. that in celebration of World Poetry Day. Yes, There's a lot. Yes. So we have that event happening March 21st. Um, World Poetry Day is obviously the most significant day for us poets. 
and it was really nice to be, to be able to plan this event and have it happening on that day so it's the 21st which is this coming Thursday 8 p.m at Cricket Legends and we got we, listen we got a pack line up we got Sun Rock performing Sun Rock honestly you ever watch World I Know with Nick Cannon I feel <laughs> like Sun Rock will matriculate into that I feel like I that. watched World I Know a little too much <laughs> <laughs> I think Sun Rock is perfect for that we got Sun Rock we got Ruby Tech we got myself we got Sirius the third we got Damani Ray for those of you who watching who don't know who he is he's I think He's won quite a few medals at NIFCA. I'm not sure how many, but he's phenomenal. He had an album back in 2016 that is one of my favorite spoken word albums. We got Enrico Suave, Shia Antoinette, and a variety of poets, younger poets that some people may not hear of, heard of, like Ariel Hamilton, Malachi Hope. And we touched on everything come World Poetry Day. And I don't know if any of y'all ever like, been to a full poetry show. I know what that's like, but it's, it's like going to church. <laughs> in, in, a, in, a, in a very entertaining way. Blasphemy, I say. <laughs> I'm kidding. I look forward to that. Yeah. But uh, I must offer congratulations. I don't think yes. I've seen you since you took the Frank Cullimore uh, Literary yes. Endowment Award in January yes. of this January, year. January, yes, uh, yes. For In the Summer. In the Summer. Yeah. 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 So uh, that, that piece is very near and dear to my heart. I would have entered the competition last year and we had the award ceremony back in January at the Frank Connemore Hall. So this is the first time they're doing a spoken word competition. They have the literary competition, but this is the first ever spoken word one. So I'm the inaugural winner. I'm the first person to win that with my piece in the summer. I came first and Lashana Griffith came second. And it's a big deal, you know, because spoken word has never already been included, right? So for them to do that, for them to see the movement, for them to see the, the, you know, the activity happening, yeah. it means a lot. When you said it was a big deal, I thought you were going to say it was a big deal because you beat Lashana. <laughs> 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 All right, so give us a little piece of uh, In the Summer to close out the show. Sure. Um, so the piece goes like this. In the summer, black boys are baptized by bullets. They bathe in blasphemy as the OG says, blasphemy. In the summer, bones can break like bread in communion. And I've seen a union of boy and God. Boy meets Heavenly Father before he gets to know his earthly one. Boy becomes pilot to another plane of existence. Boy flies off the handle. In the summer, the streets are hot and black boys bowl tempers on their head top. It really knew you selling the hot head big man cool out. Cause once he take that tool out, he willing to fix that problem for good. Trigger finger itching to scratch you off the senses. This paint up. Frustration is fossilized. Black boy becomes crustacean and never comes out of his shell. As black men, we tend to struggle with mental health, but knowing black men, we can probably attribute that to something else. We assert our stance, the reproductive of circumstance, and we never extend an olive branch to our family tree. As black men, we often reject peace. We know the snakes in the grass, but we refuse to cut the weeds. We find therapy and attain peace, and we attend our session daily. Black boy is a walking distraction. And if you want to see more, you've got to come to the show. Woo! <laughs> I am ready. Thursday night, it's at Cricket Legends. Yes, yes. I absolutely will be there. I want to thank you for passing through. Yes, yes. Stone thank you for having Cupid me. Stone with Cupid and uh, continue to fly the flag high. 100%. Um, you know, bringing attention to very, very, um, very serious matters through mm -hmm. your works. And uh, it's wonderful works. It's good work. So congratulations. I appreciate it. All right. Thank World you. Poetry Day on Thursday. We have something special plan for you here more in Barbados and then of course we continue at the poetry event so we're going to tell you more about that that's it for today's show believe it or not what a wonderful way to end it tomorrow we're talking HR with her map Dr. Rouse is going to be in for our doc talk um, we're going to have other members of the faculty of humanities and education as we look at history and philosophy and how both of those disciplines can be incorporated into other areas of study and your everyday life and careers as well and the climb 2024 the motivational event for entrepreneurs with sharita odell that is going to be in the spotlight as well so if it's your birthday today happy birthday i hope you have a great one remember to wear your smiles do something wonderful for somebody else and whatever you do make sure you are tuned in at six o'clock in the morning for another morning barbados presentation have a good one bye bye Wake up, wake up, wake up, wake up. Barbados, get up. Good morning.